to the Make a Mental Note podcast, where mental health professionals share information and perspectives that illuminate, educate, and is worthy of a mental note. And now your host, Chris Quarto. Hi, everyone. I am so glad you chose to spend some time with me on the Make a Mental Note podcast. There's certainly a lot of podcast options out there, and I'm honored that you decided to listen to this one. Since this is the first Make a Mental Note episode, let me tell you a little bit about me, and then I'll talk about the podcast. I'm a licensed psychologist in Tennessee and a licensed professional counselor in Michigan, which is where I got my start. And I provide counseling services to adults. And although I counsel kids and adolescents for many years, I had to limit that part of my practice due to time constraints. So now I just consult with parents and and teachers and school counselors regarding their kids and students. I also conduct psychological evaluations for all age levels, but my primary focus is evaluating clients for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, I've worked in community mental health centers, psychiatric hospitals, and private practices for about 25 years now, and I'm also a professor in the professional counseling program at Middle Tennessee State University. Okay, so enough about me. Let me tell you about the podcast. This is the first of many podcasts that feature mental health professionals who practice in the greater Nashville, Tennessee area. Every now and then I'll venture out and ask professionals from across the United States to participate, but the main idea of the podcast is to provide information to listeners about types of mental health resources that are available in the area as well as educating listeners about things like thinking, emotions, uh, behaviors, and relationships. Podcasts are released on Fridays on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, so if you like, you can set up an RSS feed so you can automatically receive the podcast and listen to them at your leisure. I've also placed the podcast on my website, chrisquarto.com, and my last name is spelled Q U. A-R-T-O. Think of court with an O at the end. So you can access them there too. I am super excited to launch the podcast and to see where this leads. Now, one thing I'll do at the beginning of each podcast is to provide a mental health tip of the day. And I do this because I truly believe that education is one of the keys to healing and mental wellness. And so here's the tip for today. And it's nothing earth shattering. Focus on the basics, like eating healthily, getting enough sleep, and exercise, even if it's just um, walking around the neighborhood, because these are the building blocks of mental wellness. Something else that I'll do sometime during each podcast interview is to direct your attention to something that the guest discusses, because it's important and something I want you to make a mental note of. In fact, I'll ask you about it at the end of the interview because once again, learning is key to mental wellness. Okay, for my first guest on the Make a Mental Note podcast is Rod Kutitsky, who is a psychotherapist in Nashville. Rod has been uh, working in the field for a number of years and shares some keen insights into why people experience problems and what they can do to help themselves. So, Without further ado, here's my interview with Rod Kutitsky. Well, I'm happy to introduce our first guest, Rod Kutitsky. Uh, he's our very first Make a Mental Note podcast uh, interviewee here. And uh, Rod is a pastoral counselor and psychotherapist in Nashville who specializes in couples counseling. And welcome to the podcast, Rod. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Well, tell us a little bit more about uh, who you are, maybe a glimpse into your personal life, and then uh, tell us about the type of work that you do as well. Yeah, I've been in Nashville since 1991 in a private practice in a church setting, um, 1998, 2000-ish, I joined a group called the Pastoral Center for Healing, and we're a consortium of six pastoral therapists all in private practice and we support each other and I now work out of a, a house that's behind a church 
uh, with my five colleagues. I specialize and I work with couples only and uh, really deal, I think, with what's normal. I help couples move from unconscious ways of relating into conscious ways. What was, uh, you, you said that you work with couples primarily, um, and what was your decision to just to work with that population? Well, when I moved here, I was a generalist for the first five or six years, but discovered that my passion really is working with couples. Uh -huh. um, and what I brought to Nashville, Imago Relationship Therapy, I was the first Imago therapist in the Nashville area. It also really gave me uh, a market niche, but more importantly, it was where I felt like I was really effective. Um, and again, it's a part of my passion of helping couples get out of what's natural, falling in love in a power struggle, and help them break through into more intimate ways of relating. You had mentioned uh, Imago therapy, and a lot of people might not be familiar with that. Maybe you could just uh, give us a little idea about what that's all about. Right. Uh, Imago Relationship Therapy was started by Harville Hendricks in the 1980s. He wrote the book, Getting the Love You Want, A Guide for Couples. And that book was a category killer and still is. It's in its third or fourth printing. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list. And uh, the basic premise is that we all fall in love and that it is an uh, irrational minds that pick our partners, but it's an unconscious projective mechanism. You can walk into a room full of people and go, not attracted, not attracted, attracted. Uh -huh. And there's a particular person you're drawn to. And then our courtship rituals are about checking out that basic attraction process. And if it's in a match, we call it an imago match. If you fall in love and make commitments, then you've uh, picked someone based on unconscious projections. I see. And you're prone to pick someone who's your complement, who's your opposite, and who embodies for you the positives and negatives of uh, your primary caregivers, who embodies for you the ways you got loved growing up and also the ways you were failed growing up. I see. So some of those uh, childhood experiences uh, figure into people's relationships, obviously, and it sounds like that's part of the work that, that you do um, with this brand of therapy. Absolutely. Well, it's, I'm... Oh, go ahead. Well, I think it's... Uh, and it's helping couples, um, again, move into conscious ways of relating. We think of it as getting out of the fight-flight part of the brain and moving into the prefrontal cortex and being able to have conscious conversations with your partner that aren't rooted in reactivity. And re reactivity, fight-flight, and your emotions are scripted and have more to do with the past and the present. And that's how we get triggered, have our buttons pushed sure. in intimate relations. Well, I'm always interested in um, talking to people about why they went into the helping profession. And, and perhaps you could share uh, with the Make a, a Mental Note family what motivated you to go into that direction. What's your uh, story, Ron? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm an Episcopal priest by background, mm -hmm. and I served churches for 10 years. And uh, in that process, found that counts I felt drawn to do counseling. And it was the failure of my first marriage that really got me to go back into graduate school at the Institutes of Religion and Health and start training as a psychotherapist. And it was there uh, that I met Harville Hendricks. And he did a presentation where in just a couple of hours, I fully got the failure of my first marriage. It was like, huh. oh my, that's why I married her. That's why it didn't work. And more importantly, this is how it could have worked. Yeah, the light bulb went on there. Yeah, big yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how uh, you know those personal experiences really shape the, the types of decisions that we make, big decisions that we make uh, in our lives. Well, I I know that the types of people that you work with, and um, I, I wonder with all this this couples work that you do, do you find that there's a, a common 
theme in terms of the problems they have or the things that they're struggling with? Uh, you know, um, yes. And the interesting thing for me is that um, all of those themes are rooted in the psychological term is a developmental arrest. Sure. And I find uh, basic patterns in couples like a pursuer avoider, and where the uh, this pursuer has abandonment issues rooted in their childhood, and the avoider had smothering issues. Or the other really uh, prominent pattern um, in this one is identity issues, where one person takes on what we call the false empowered position and the others in the disempowered position. So you have one person who's more uh, often feels like I can't do anything right, there's no way I, I can please you, and the other person is feeling unimportant and devalued and invisible and you don't listen to me and uh, that's where the breakdown happens in their love is in that mm -hmm. that power differential that uh, that phrase that you use developmental arrest I, th I think is a very important one and the and the uh, it may not be apparent what that means maybe you could just explain very briefly what's meant by that term developmental arrest yeah Chris I, I'm glad to and, and help me if I uh, stay in too much psychological <laughs> language here um, but you know I, I really look at the the first three developmental periods and the first one is attachment and that's from zero to 18 months and what a child needs is uh, to be securely attached and that's all about food touch and attention sure. and however you got that food touch and attention you have an imprint in this primitive part of your brain mm -hmm. where your emotions and your fight-flight uh, center is and you know if you are uh, let's go for the extremes if you're born to someone who's in postpartum depression mm -hmm. or addicted to crack cocaine or alcoholic then you, the odds are your attachment needs are not going to be met and around food touch and attention you're sure. going to have a lot of wounding uh, and so you're going to carry that into your relational agenda in your adult life the the second developmental phase is called exploration and I think there's just a core difference between how we raise men and women because it seems like all women end up with what we call the invisibility wound. Mm -hmm. And little girls tend to be more compliant, more quiet. They're more willing to be by themselves. And the only way they seem to get attention is to go into distress sure. or to have to pursue the mother. Where little boys tend to feel smothered and move more quickly toward autonomy and independence. Mm -hmm. And that's what sets up this dance between the false empowered and the disempowered. So essentially what happens, I think what I'm hearing you say is that some of those critical tasks or experiences um, that happen early on in life, if, uh, for example, a, a person's needs aren't properly met, uh, whether that's for uh, food, love, attention, whatever that, those types of things stay with a person and affect them later on in life. Is that sort of what this is all about? Yeah, it, we, it, it's like an imprint. It's like we're imprinted, and that imprint is timeless. Okay. And this is what we're going to act out unconsciously. But the good news is we have the potential of becoming conscious of, of this relational agenda that's been imprinted, and we have the ability to uh, let it inform us and not react out of it but use it to inform us and then make a conscious reaction and that's the transition I help couples do is to move uh, into that more conscious way of relating mm -hmm. and the primary way I help them do that is through what we call the Imago dialogue or the couples dialogue and it has three components to mirror to validate and to empathize and those three things are actually a part of a developmentally corrective emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And to do those things, you have to be 
in the conscious part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, is the only part that lights up in an MRI when we're in a state of compassion and understanding for someone else. So if you can be in that conscious place and have a conversation with your partner, you can make a connection that mm -hmm. can help repair the damage of the reactivity. Well, yeah, and I think that really relates to um, what I was going to ask you about. I, I'm always curious about client uh, success stories, you know, clients who have uh, really seemed to benefit from counseling. And if you think about some of your um, successes, what's what's been your... Um, What's been your recipe to, to help yep. a client move from point A when they first see you for counseling to, to point B at that, at that end of counseling? What's, what's that all about? Well, let me, let me set this up because I'm going to tell you how I do my first initial session all because right. the way I structure this makes it so I'm 100% successful. Okay, <laughs> and, that's good to know. <laughs> I know, but the way I structure it is a couple will come in to see me and uh, I ask what's going on in the present, where's the hurt, the disappointment, um, and I get in five, ten minutes the, the pattern that they're in and I know the developmental arrest that's underneath that pattern. Sure. And then I ask them, uh, what attracted you to your partner? What were the qualities you saw in them? And then I ask about how opposites attract and how that might be true about them. Mm -hmm. And I get the qualities and the complementarity that drew them into this relationship. And then I take about 15 minutes to have each of them give me a snippet of what it was like growing up in their family. And I get the positive and negatives of their relationship with mom, the positives and negatives of their relationship with dad and their birth order and what their role was in that family system. And then I spend the second half of my time, about 30 minutes, walking them through um, a picture of the tripartite brain, uh, how we have three parts to our brain, the bottom parts, the brain stem, that's where the fight-flight response is. The midbrain is where our emotions get regulated and registered, uh -huh. and the, those neurons get wired together in the first four to five years of your life, and your emotional pathways are pretty much, well, to a large part laid down. And then the role of the cortex and the prefrontal cortex, and I, I walk them through and can tell them from their story, so this is what I hear in your story, and what I'm and I use the phrase, what I'm making up about you out of this 15, 30 minute interview is that this is probably what happened in, with you and your family growing up. And this is why you were drawn into a relationship with this particular person. And this is why y'all are in a power struggle. And now if y'all come back and work with me, this is what we can do to make things better and to help you move into a more conscious way of relating. And if this makes sense to you, we're probably on the same page. Come back and let's go for it. Right. If it doesn't make sense, I'm not your guy. If you're not willing to look at how the past impinges on the present and how you have a, a scripted relational agenda that your buttons are getting pushed and that you're acting out unconsciously, there are other modes of marital therapy that deal with only the here and now and go interview other people. Right. So because I'm so clear, everyone that comes to me, not every couple stays together, but every couple learns. Sure. You know, and, and that to me is the critical factor, is that uh, I'm going to help people move into more conscious ways of relating. And in that process, the large majority stay together, but some relationships are past point, and uh, there's so much enmity going on underneath that uh, they don't stay together, but at least they terminate with some learning and understanding. Because if you don't, what happens is you just go fall in love with someone else and end up in a power struggle with them. Right. And the same dynamics going to yeah. happen all over again. Yeah, it's all repeated. So I guess what I hear you saying for your, your recipe, there, there are a lot of different elements or ingredients to that recipe. 
Um, one of the first things really is I, I heard you say that it really starts from the beginning. I mean, we talked before about the whole developmental arrest idea, but even for your recipe for success, it's that first session where you get the background information, you find out what the patterns are, what's been going on. And it sounds like you do a little bit of uh, education with that tripartite, Absolutely. I think is what you called it. Yeah. Um, so there's an educational element there. And I think the whole idea if they continue to work with you is trying to make some of those unconscious patterns more conscious so they have a better ability to recognize oh i didn't realize i did that it may relate to what happened earlier on perhaps to that developmental arrest and yeah. now maybe we can do something about it exactly yeah. exactly yeah and i and i think that 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 makes a lot of sense to me i think a lot of people really don't take into consideration how those er, those early developmental experiences play such a role in what happens uh, as adults. Uh, they're not conscious of it, though. They just aren't aware of that. It's just become so ingrained. Um, and it sounds like what you try to do is to try to make that more conscious to them. Exactly. Yeah. We're going to pick, project, or provoke our partner into representing for us the positives and negatives from our childhood experiences. We pick someone who's prone to, we will project it onto them if, if they don't act that way, and we will provoke it out of them sure. to act that way. Right. It's an amazing mechanism. But you know, Chris, to me, this is the really interesting part, and this is where my passion comes in what I do, because I think that we've moved into prizing marriage because of love for a profound reason. I don't know if you're aware, but we've only been doing this for a couple hundred years. Uh -huh. That this is like a liminal generation, a whole new... If you put this 200 years in a cosmic time clock, this would be like one second before midnight on December the 31st. Sure. It's a little bitty blip of time. Before that, it was family arranged. Before that, it was tribally arranged. Before that, it was serial monogamy in a tribal context. Mm -hmm. But we've moved into prizing marriage because of love. You know, Korea, India, China, where it was family arranged 20 years ago, they're all marrying because of love in the metropolitan areas. It's only in the rural areas that it's still family arranged. Sure. And we're prizing this mechanism that our unconscious has this role in picking our partners. And, uh, and I think that there's a real profound reason that if we can get two people who are opposites, because opposites attract and who uh, at first hurt each other, if we can get them to move into understanding, to stop the, the hurting, to uh, renew the love that they had at the beginning in a more deeper, profound way because it's based really in knowing each other and valuing each other for who you really are. I think there's hope that we could learn to do this as city, states, and nation. Sure. That this could be the game changer. We might have world peace because <laughs> your partner love each other. Yes, yes. You know, you're loving each other, and you're going to raise your children more lovingly, with less wounding. The world's going to be a better place. Right, right. So, and I can see how, uh, you know, when you interact this way with clients, how – how that would really give them a lot of hope. Uh, and, and I guess that's part of the whole process too, isn't it, is, is giving couples hope. Yeah, and, and, and that's really what I do in that first session is really say, if this doesn't give you hope, go talk to someone else. Because sure. you, you deserve to be in a, in a, to get help and hope for where you are. Yeah. And I don't claim to have the answer for everybody. Well, and you know, not all clients benefit from counseling. I'm sure you can think of some clients that, that you've worked with that you'd like a, a, a do-over or, or maybe there was something about the client or their situation that, uh, you know, prevented them from benefiting from counseling. So so what is it that you do to give give clients that hope that things can get better, that that you're the one that can help them? Well, uh, um, I, th I, th I think that probably the, the value of what I do, uh, and, and what I do really does have two components, and you nailed it earlier, that a big part of it is psychoeducational. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I do weekend workshops and seminars, and if couples are going to come work with me, I make it very clear they need to do the weekend workshop, that that's worth six months of therapy. It's a multi-modality learning opportunity. There's journaling, lecture ads, uh, guided imagery, uh, things that help tap the unconscious. And couples leave that weekend workshop experience usually profoundly connect, reconnected to each other. So it's a great jump start. But then in my office, uh, the couples are barring me in psychological language. They're barring me to be their observer ego. Sure. But I'm holding them in this dialogical process until they can learn to do it on their own. And it's their experience in my office of going from harmony, disharmony, harmony, disharmony until it just wears you out sure. and to go in harmony, disharmony, repair. And they learn to do that work of repair in my office. And the couples that, uh, you know, I really serve the best are the ones that, like, get it and get uh, and stop their pattern and then learn to do dialogue on their own at home. Right. And they can re reenact what we've done in my office at home. I tell them my job is to work myself out of a job. <laughs> you know? And if I'm doing good work, you're going to learn to do this. Yeah. But, uh, you know, sadly, not every couple can do it. And there's some people with what we call in psychological language early primitive wounding mm -hmm. that it's just more of a struggle to tame that reptilian fight flight brain. And dialogue doesn't work 100% of the time. Sure. And uh, so those are the couples that have a harder time with me. But I try to move them more into not the fact that they're going to learn to do it on their own, but they're going to learn what to do instead sure. uh, uh, of going into the fight experience. Yeah, and I think it's true, too, that... Uh, with some clients, it's just not, it's just important not to move uh, too far too fast, maybe right. because of those earlier experiences that they've had because it's too threatening. Um, well, I wonder if you agree with this, Rod, because you were just talking about the psychoeducational uh, workshops that you do. Speaking of that, do you think that it's important that people educate themselves ab about mental health professionals before they decide to see someone for counseling? I mean, if you think about how most people buy a car, they'll, they'll usually look at a few cars, <laughs> yeah. they'll find some things about the cars, price, number of miles, you know, how many owners, that kind of stuff. And I think it makes sense that people do the same thing when they consider who to see for counseling, don't you think? I, I do. And, I, you know, personally, I guess I find that my best referrals are from a form or, or people that get referred to me by former clients. Sure. And I think uh, when I think about people finding a mental health professional, I think there are two important ways of going about it. And the first one is to be uh, is to be willing to talk to people and get personal referrals and to find out mm -hmm. who uh, some of your peers or friends have had success with. And I think it's changing in our culture where people no longer feel embarrassed or ashamed that they're going to a therapist. I think. I think we're seeing a switch where people have a sense of pride. Of, yeah, I I'll think so. Help. Yeah, I agree with that. And then I think the other component is those first two initial sessions. And I think people, uh, if they're open, can have an intuitive knowledge. Is this a good fit? And that it really does pay to shop. And if it doesn't, and I recommend people do a first session with two or three therapists uh -huh. and r really make a choice rooted in this feels right the chemistry's here right so so part of this part of this is talking to people who have either seen you or another person get those get that kind of information uh do some comparison shopping is what i just kind of heard yeah. you say there uh that kind of stuff too first session do an initial session with two or three different people yeah. The interesting thing, and you, I'm sure you experienced this doing individual therapy, but you know, that's what individual therapy really is, that emotionally corrective experience. Yes. And they're going to end up probably uh, having some issues with the therapist. Right. It's going to give them uh, grist for the mill and things to work through, and that's a good thing. And that sure they want to 
you know, pick someone who they get. I, I could do that with. I could be in relationship with this person because I really believe it's the relationship that heals. Yes. We've got, you know, 50 different ways of doing therapy out there, but I think what every one of them have in common is the relationship with the therapist. And I do think that's the critical component uh, for the healing process. I, I agree with that. Well, you know, oftentimes I, I have this metaphor in my head about how clients get stuck into a, a, a negative way of thinking or feeling or behaving. I, I have this image of a car that's stuck in the mud or, in my case, snow. I lived in Michigan, so I got stuck in the snow a lot. But you tried everything, but you just people, clients, they keep spinning their wheels. You know, so let's say that somebody is listening to this uh, podcast today and they think to themselves, yeah, I can, re I can relate to that. What's uh, one strategy or what's one technique that, that they could use today to help themselves, you, you know, a little, get a little bit more traction, get unstuck, even if it's just a small change? Do you have any uh, words of wisdom or words of advice along those lines? And I know it might depend on what the issue is, but anything just generally speaking? Yeah, in in general, um, you know, uh, I think there's a huge power in um, whether you call it meditation or centering prayer uh -huh. or uh, having a quiet time within yourself. But I, I really think that uh, when if reading uh, self help books, mm -hmm. being self reflective, and uh, sitting with yourself in that kind of like period of silence is a real way of building the muscle of the observer ego and that's the muscle that lets us be aware of ourselves and others that helps us take a breath and that's a, oh that's another big one mm -hmm. it's just breathe sure if you take two or three really deep breaths breathe into the count of seven or eight and exhale it fully uh -huh. you're going to over oxygenate your fight flight response you're going to calm down and hopefully then make a better decision from that centered place. Sure. So so some deep breathing, some meditation, and the importance of being self-aware, too. I think I agree with that totally. I think a lot of clients that come in just don't have that. And I think it gets back to somewhat what you were talking about before, about the unconscious and how we do things that we're really not even aware of. Yeah, yeah. Well, how can a, a potential client uh, contact you if they're interested in setting up an appointment with you, Rod? Yeah, um, my preference is through my website, and I've made it easy. Okay. I don't expect anyone to be able to spell Katitsky. <laughs> uh, it's just Rod K, Rod K dot net, R O D K dot N E T. Rod K dot net. That's yeah. easy. And I've got lots of information on my website, and they can get a f kind of picture of how I work. And, uh, and then uh, I invite people to come do that initial consult. I don't charge for that unless uh -huh. they come back and work with me. So, and I think it's an important, and I've had a lot of clients do that initial and not come back. But let me know. They learn a lot from just doing that initial session. I think that's that's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, it's it gets back to the whole comparison shopping idea that we were talking about earlier, and and I think that anybody uh, who who's interested in couples counseling should should consider taking you up on that idea. So, uh, well, Rod, Rod K <laughs> dot net. So. Okay. Well, Rod, thanks so much for spending time with us today and uh, really appreciate uh, all the words of wisdom that you shared with the audience. Well, uh, thank you. I think what you're doing uh, could be a real service to our community, and I'm grateful you're putting this together. Well, thanks so much, Rod. All righty. Okay. That was a great interview with Rod Katitsky. He uh, provided some really good information as to why people experience problems and and what they can do to move from where they are in that relationship conflict uh, to a more harmonious relationship. Now, remember how I said at the beginning of the podcast that the Make a Mental Note podcast is all about educating people and that learning is a key to mental wellness? Well, I want to see how much you learn from today's podcast by asking you a question about something Rod talked about. Remember when he was talking about a developmental arrest? What did, what did he mean by that? 
And how does it how does it figure into why people experience relationship problems? And you can pause this if you want just to kind of think about that. Well, remember that as infants and young kids, we have certain needs. The the need for food is a basic one, but also the need for love and uh, to be able to trust that someone, and usually it's our parents or caregivers, are going to provide for those needs. And if that doesn't happen, then that can leave us with a psychological scar. Now, Rod referred to that as an imprint. And so if we grow up learning that we can't trust that our needs will be taken care of in the, in the context of this uh, relationship with our parents or, or caregivers, then that could impact the extent to which we risk committing ourselves to others in adolescence and adulthood. So consider this. Take a look at yourself and ask yourself, what's something that happened to me when I was younger, perhaps in the context of a relationship, that affects me today? And if it's something serious, what would it take for me to go talk to a therapist about this? Like Rod said, there's really not as big of a stigma about seeing mental health professionals like in the past. So keep that in mind if you've ever considered talking to someone. So remember, it's through education and understanding within the context of a warm and supportive counseling relationship that healing occurs. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for listening to episode one of the Make a Mental Note podcast. I I can't wait for you to hear our upcoming episodes. We have some really good people coming up. And I, I consider it to be a privilege to do these podcasts. And you know, I, I think to myself, you know, there's some therapists who are doing some really good work out there. And we need to get more people who are in need of help to, to see them. And hopefully listening to this podcast might motivate you to do just that. Well, thanks again. And please visit my website, chrisquarto.com for show notes of this episode and other valuable resources. And by the way, if you liked what you've heard today, do me a favor and get the word out on Facebook and Twitter. Let your friends and family members know that this podcast really is worthy of a mental note. They can get it through iTunes, uh, through Stitcher Radio, or they can go to my website to listen to the episode. So thanks again and goodbye for now.